So hello everybody and thanks again to the um, organising committee for inviting me here to present this lecture. So over the uh, next 20 minutes or so I'm going to talk initially about the historical perspective um, which led us to defining maturity onset diabetes of the young as a separate diabetes etiology, then go on to the genetic background accounting for these MODI patients and use the insight provided by this genetic background to explain some of the clinical features associated with these common MODI subtypes. So you probably are aware that uh, the first clinical descriptions of patients who have MODI appeared in the clinical literature now almost uh, over three decades ago in 1974 by Robert Tattersall in a paper that he titled Familial Mild Diabetes with Dominant Inheritance. And in this landmark paper, he described three cases that he was looking after in King's Hospital in London. And these three cases shared several common features. They'd all been diagnosed with diabetes at a relatively young age, so in their adolescence or in their early 20s. They'd all, as was um, traditional at that time, so before the introduction of oral hyperglycemic agents, been started on insulin therapy, but for whatever reason, over the course of their diabetes um, history, had chosen to come off their insulin and try oral sulfonylurea drugs. This was either at the suggestion of their managing physicians because they were having hyperglycemia on their insulin or, because, or at the patient's request because they'd seen family members who'd been successfully treated with sulfonylurea drugs. And what was striking about these cases was they all managed to maintain good glycemic control on the sulfonylurea um, drugs, much to the surprise of their managing physicians. And each of these patients had a striking family history of diabetes, so often describing at least three generations of diabetes with a similar phenotype to the um, proband described in these cases. And Robert Tattersall concluded that this type of diabetes was distinct from the more usual insulin-dependent ketosis prone type of ju juvenile diabetes and provided remarkable insight um, indicating that diabetes was genetically heterogene heterogeneous. Um, a year later, he, in collaboration with um, Stefan Fajent, who he joined in Chicago, uh, first introduced the term maturity onset diabetes of young into the literature. And this was based on a description of a large pedigree in Chicago. And again, this family shared similar features to the cases that he described one year earlier. And they defined maturity onset diabetes of the young based on three clinical features. So this was early onset diabetes in at least one family member, usually diagnosed before the age of 25. The presence of non-insulin dependent diabetes, so that these patients were able to main maintain good glycemic control off insulin for at least two years, or in those that had started on insulin, had some evidence of being able to produce insulin of their own um, outside the honeymoon period, and had a strong family history of diabetes, um, and which was suggestive of an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. So this pattern of inheritance raised the possibility that this was a single gene disorder, a monogenic disorder. And as Machak alluded to earlier, the um, genetic discovery in monogenic diabetes has been um, less challenging than that for polygenic diabetes or type 2 diabetes. And this was partly facilitated by having access to large um, families of several generations with a similar phenotype and also facilitated by the fact that MODI um, and other monogenic disorders were caused by a single gene which was highly penetrant in the family members um, that had this gene defect. The first gene that was described in association with MODI was glucokinase gene, and this was described um, concurrently in a British and a French family. And glucokinase had been um, identified as a possible candidate gene, and I'll go on to speak about why this um, was a good candidate based on the pathophysiology associated with glucokinase. Um, and a few years later, um, after, after susceptibility loci in uh, chromosomes 12 and chromosomes 20 had been linked to MODI families, um, Graham Bell's group in Chicago identified the HNF1-alpha or hepatocyte nuclear factor 1-alpha and the HNF4-alpha or, or hepatocyte nuclear factor 4-alpha genes as um, other common causes of MODI. And since... Uh, now almost two decades ago, there have been at least 10 different genes identified that can cause this MODI phenotype. 
and the different proportions of the genes involved in MODI varies across the populations involved, but most um, commonly will involve uh, represented by the green arrow in, a, in about a quarter to a fifth of patients um, a gene defect in the glucokinase gene, um, and in approximately two-thirds of patients a gene defect in genes that encode nuclear transcription factors, and this will most commonly involve the hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 alpha gene or HNF1 alpha gene, and in its, a smaller proportion of patients, so 5 to 10 percent of patients, the hepatocyte nuclear factor 4 alpha gene. I've also noted down three other genes that encode nuclear transcription factors that can cause this MODI phenotype, um, most notably hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 beta. There are also some rare causes of the MODI phenotype, um, so the insulin gene, the cell gene, and you'll also notice by the orange arrow there's a small proportion of patients um, who, definitely, who seem to have the MODI phenotype that we refer to as MODI-X patients where the underlying gene uh, cause has not been identified. And going back to the title of this talk, the, identif the identification of the various um, genes involved in MODI led to the realization that the specific genetic subtype of MODI determines the clinical presentation of these patients, their prognosis, and also their response to treatment. And it was only when the genetic basis was um, identified that this had been realized. Prior to that, the clinical descriptions of MODI um, tended to follow the same, same uh, phenotype. So I'm going to take uh, the common MODI subtypes and go through their typical clinical features um, and try and link it back to the um, pathophysiology uh, determined by that gene defect. So firstly, going to start with the glucokinase gene. And you'll know that this encodes the enzyme glucokinase, and this schematic uh, represents the pancreatic beta cell. So the um, glucose uh, from outside the cell is first taken up by the GLUT2 transporter, and the glucokinase enzyme catalyzes the first stage of this glycolytic pathway. And this really is the rate-limiting step for the remainder of the pathway. So it, um, the, the change of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate by this enzyme changes the ATP to ADP ratio. This is sensed by a ATP-sensitive potassium channel, leads to its closure. This depolarizes the membrane, leading to an influx of intracellular calcium, and then this allows exocytosis of insulin. So you can see that glucokinase is a key regulatory enzyme in this pathway. And because of its rate-limiting step, it's been referred to as the pancreatic glucose sensor. And mutations um, in this gene lead to a change in the kinetics of this enzyme. And that's represented by this schematic. So we've got insulin secretion on the y-axis and plasma glucose on the x-axis. And this represents the um, kinetics of the enzyme in the wild type. So that the maximal activity is usually at the middle of this slope, and that will equate to a, a normal plasma glucose of a, between 5 and 6. So as the plasma glucose increases above that level, the insulin secretion will increase, and that will pull back down the um, plasma glucose. Similarly, if the glucose drops below that level, the insulin secretion rate will drop off allowing the glucose to normalize. In the case of the um, mutation carriers, the kinetics of the enzyme shift um, towards the right so that the maximal activity on this curve is reset at a higher level, more around the 7 level compared to the wild type at around 5. So the primary defect in glucokinase MODI is primarily beta cell um, driven and is a defect, as, it, as I've explained, in glucose sensing by the beta cell. And insulin secretion is therefore um, initiated at an elevated glucose level, so about two millimoles higher than the wild type enzyme. And so essentially these patients still have a regulated glycemia and they really represent the only patient group with diabetes that are still able to respond to extremes of glucose. And this pathological defect really explains the clinical features associated with this type of MODI. So these patients have mild fasting hyperglycemia, as you might have predicted. So with a fasting plasma glucose that's elevated, usually between 5.5 and 8, 
They also, as they're able to respond to high glucose levels, have a HbA1c that's usually below 8. So they normally have glycemia um, that's not elevated to the ranges that you can see with other types of diabetes. Um, and similarly, because they are able to respond to high levels of glucose um, after a glucose load, such as that given in an oral glucose tolerance test, they often have a similar blood glucose rise, so usually less than 4 millimoles per litre, um, which is similar to that seen in non-diabetic non patients. And as you might expect, given that these patients have got largely normal glucose tolerance, they're largely asymptomatic from their diabetes. So they're picked up on routine screening, such as during pregnancy or for a medical exam for insurance. So what about treatment for these patients? So there have been some small observational studies that suggest that treatment in these patients does not affect their glycemic control. So they seem to maintain the same glucose levels, whether they're diet controlled, whether they're treated with oral um, hyperglycemic agents, or whether they're treated with insulin. Um, and that's, as you might predict again from the pathophysiology of defect of, the, of these patients, their insulin, they are still able to respond by producing insulin of their own. So by adding in insulin or adding in hyperglycemic agents, um, it doesn't really affect that, uh, that defect. So in general, we advise that anti-diabetic medications don't need to be used in these patients with the exception of pregnancy. And usually these patients do not need to be followed up in secondary care, so do not need to see hospital specialists. And um, we would recommend annual monitoring of their glycemic control by their general practitioners. In terms of prognosis for these patients, it's actually very good. Um, so again, observational studies suggest that there's uh, very low level of microvascular complications. And there was a recent abstract presented at the diabetes um, conference in the UK, which of about 100 patients with glucokinase modi who were followed up for um, an average of 50 years, there was very few patients who had evidence of retinopathy or nephropathy. There's not um, any large studies in terms of macrovascular um, outcomes for these patients, but it's likely that it's um, similar again to the background population. And these patients have glycemia that tends to remain stable from birth uh, to death, essentially doesn't progress over their lifetime, um, with the exception that they can develop type 2 diabetes on top of that if they become obese and therefore insulin resistant. And so it's important to warn your patients about that um, in terms of maintaining their diet and weight. So I'm going to now compare the clinical features that we've seen with glucokinase MODI with um, those seen in transcription factor MODI, so due to HNF1-alpha and HNF4-alpha mutations. So these genes, as I mentioned, encode nuclear transcription factors. And that obviously is important for the expression of genes in various different tissues, but in the case of HNF1-alpha and HNF4-alpha, it's particularly important in the liver, kidney, and the pancreas. And it's not entirely clear how mutations in these genes cause diabetes as a phenotype, but um, it's likely that it affects both the development of the pancreatic beta cells and also the function of the pancreatic beta cells during life in terms of uh, disrupting expression of beta cell genes.